Good morning, church. We're so glad that you've joined us today. If this is your first time, we'd invite you to go onto our website to fbcplatcity.com slash welcome, where you can find some more information about the church and get connected. Tonight from 6 to 7.30, we'll be hosting our usual groups for students from 5th grade to 12th grade, but we'll also be hosting a special session of Strong Families led by Nick Macaluso, licensed psychologist and longtime member of our church. Nick will be leading us through a solution-based discussion on what it looks like to parent preteens from the perspective of scripture and clinical psychology. All of our ministries at FBC are intended to carry out the mission of the church, which is to connect people to God, to each other, and to what God is doing in the rest of the world. We asked Nick to share the vision of Strong Families and how that fits into the purpose of the church. The aim of Strong Families is to meet people where they're at. Um, if you're a parent, you have struggle. It's that simple. Um, but you also have joy. Uh, what we want to do as a church is help people with struggle and, and give struggle a home in our church. Um, one thing that was really good that God did for us is he gave us a community to struggle with. Um, and that that is a big part of strong families that when you show up uh, immediately, maybe you're a little bit guarded. Um, I'm a little bit anxious because I'm about to talk to, you know, a group of strangers. But one of the neatest things is seeing people kind of let that guard down. Um, and talk about some of their struggles, not even, you know, getting into the depths of, of what some of the struggles are, but once you let a little bit of the struggle be known, uh, immediately you find out that other people have the same problems that you have. Um, and that is just finding a home for your struggle and, and in the middle of it, uh, a feeling a sense of belonging. One of the worst things that you can allow yourself to do is struggle alone. It can lead to a lot of bad outcomes. Uh, it is why we use drugs. It is why we get into anything bad, bad relationships, um, depression, isolation. Uh, nobody should struggle alone. We have other opportunities to create community in the church. On March 7th, we'll be starting back up with our student ministry classes from fifth grade to 12th grade on Sunday mornings at 9.30. We'll also be adding in additional adult classes. And if you'd like to be a part of that, you can email us and we'll help you find a class that's a good fit for you. That same weekend on March 5th and 6th, we'll be hosting our annual IF gathering. This is an opportunity for women of all ages to come together on Friday and Saturday for teaching and worship. You can buy your ticket online. Rusty's continuing with our sermon series this week called Beloved. We're looking specifically at the wedding at Cana and when Jesus turned water into wine. I'd like to read you some scripture from Isaiah 55. Starting in verse one, it says, Is anyone thirsty? Come and drink, even if you have no money. Come, take your choice of wine or milk. It's all free. Why spend your money on food that does not give you strength? Why pay for food that does you no good? Listen to me and you will eat what is good you will enjoy the finest food. Come to me with your ears wide open. Listen and you will find life. I will make an everlasting covenant with you. I will give you all the unfailing love I promised to David. Will you pray with me? God, we read scripture and we see examples of all of these people who had so much to give up and yet they did it in a moment to follow you. Help us to do the same, that we can see the things we hold in our hands and how cheap they are in comparison with the love and the grace that you offer to us. Help us to follow you and to love you in a way that honors you. And we know we can't do that without your help. We love you and we worship you today because you're the one true God. Amen. Hey everybody, welcome to worship. So last Sunday we started a new series and it's, it's sort of an on-ramp toward Easter. Beloved. What does it mean to be in the beloved? How do you make your heart ready for something as big, as powerful, as, as worship inducing as Easter? You can't do it in a second. You can't flip a switch and turn it on. You need to get your heart ready. So one of the things that has happened through ages has been that people have gone through a season leading up to Easter, a season of preparing your heart. A season of, of repenting of what needs to be repented of, of laying down what needs to be laid down and taking up what needs to be taken up. And we're calling this beloved. 
What does it mean, Ephesians chapter 1? What does it mean to be found in the beloved? That, that collection of people through all the ages, loved by God, repenting and coming to know Him as Lord and Savior and being in the community, the family of Christ, to be in the beloved. So, We've been talking about that, that, that line from Song of Songs, right? I am my beloved's and he is mine and his banner over me is love. We've been talking about, uh, about John, the beloved disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, but he didn't start that way. So we're going to be looking at, at some of the scenes and some of the characters that John introduces us to in his gospel, people who have experienced the love of Christ and what it means to be in the beloved. So this week, I want to take you to John chapter 2, where we're going to look again at the story of the wedding feast at Cana in Galilee when they ran out of wine and Jesus turned the water into wine. And so we're going to be talking about it in this framework. What do you need to give up in order to take up Easter? What do you need to, what do you need to put down in order to take up Easter? John John, sons of thunder, right? John gave up his thunder in order to take up his place in the beloved. At the wedding feast at Cana, they, they gave up the cheap wine in order to take up the best. And so the question today is, what do you need to lay down? What will you give up in order to take up Easter, right? In fact, the kind of the working title for today's message it may be silly to you, but what are you going to give up for Lent? Give up cheap wine. I'll tell you what I mean by that in a minute. But here's some questions I want to invite you into as we go along the journey. One, where have you been turning for joy or escape or coping? Where have you been turning instead of turning to the author of joy, the giver of every good and perfect gift because over these last months I think a lot of us have been turning just to escape whether it's to mindless entertainment or whether it's to uh, sinfully distracting stuff and maybe today is a day maybe now is a time as you on ramp toward Easter to say enough. I'm going to put that down. I'm going to give that up because I want to take up my worship at the resurrection. How have you been laboring and working and honestly finding very little satisfaction, very little return on investment? And there's this line that we'll get to in a little bit from Isaiah 55 where God says, I want to make an everlasting covenant with you, a covenant of everlasting love. And so the final question that we'll get to in a few minutes is, will you let God make his everlasting covenant of love with you? You want to jump into this? So John chapter 2 the wedding in Cana. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and also Jesus and his disciples had also been invited. And when the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. Woman, he said, why do you involve me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. You remember this story? Jesus said to the servants, fill those jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever been so desperate for, for some kind of sense of direction from Jesus that when he tells you something, you just do it to the brim all the way. They fill the stone water jars to the brim. And then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. I've always wondered, I've always wondered when the miracle took place. Did, did, did the water, when it was poured into the stone water jars, did it become wine when it went into the jars? When they dipped it up to take some to the master of the banquet, did it still look like water or had it already turned into wine? I got to wonder sometimes about the fate that it took for those servants to ladle up that liquid and offer it 
to the master of the banquet. It says, they did what was told them. They did so. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. And he did not realize where it had come from. Though the servants who had drawn from the water, drawn the water, they knew. And then he called the bridegroom aside. And he said, everyone brings out the choice wine first. And then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. I don't know, it may seem weird to you for me to talk to you about wine. And, you know, historically we've had this, this real stigma around alcohol. Can we, just, can we just agree that that's not what we're talking about today? What we're talking about today is the kind of, of imbibing of the Spirit of God that gives joy. We're talking about what Jesus talked about when he said, nobody takes new wine and puts it into an old wineskin. If they do, it'll, it'll burst the wineskin and they'll both be ruined. We're talking, about, we're talking about a kind of joy that makes glad the heart. And we're talking about the ways that we've looked for something else to do what honestly only God can do. Everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you've saved the best till now. You see where I'm coming from with that working title? What are you going to give up for Lent? Give up cheap wine? There's a place in Isaiah where it says in Isaiah 55, Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. You who have no money, come, buy and eat. Buy wine and milk without money and without cost. He says, why spend money on what is not bread? Why spend your labor on what does not satisfy? He says, listen. Listen to me and eat what is good. Listen to me and you will delight in the richest affair. He says, give ear and come to me and listen that you may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you. My faithful love promised to David. Hmm. God wants to do something in us. God is willing to do something in us. Something that He starts. Something that He finishes. Something that's not based on our ability to perform or perfect it. It's interesting to me to think about that story at, at the wedding in Cana. The cheap wine was the wine they paid for. The choice wine was the wine that was gifted to them in a way that they could have never imagined and certainly could never have afforded. He says, I want to make this everlasting covenant of love with you. You've heard me talk before about that Hebrew word chesed. It's a, it's a word that's almost untranslatable not only in our language, but in our mindset. It, it's, a, it's a love that keeps loving even when you don't love in return. It's a, it's a grace that keeps pouring out even when you turn the other way. It's, it's a love that only God can love you with. God says, I want to make that kind of covenant with you, with you. There's a place in John chapter 6. Let me pull that up for you. There's a place in John chapter 6. It's after Jesus has fed the 5,000. You know, the, the bread, the fish, all of that. And I don't know if you remember, but the story goes on from there. The end of the day, Jesus, Jesus sends everyone away, but he goes up on a high mountain to, to just commune with the Father. Maybe he's going up there to choose the choice wine. I don't know. He goes up to commune with the Father, and the, and the disciples go across to the other side of the lake, and somewhere in the middle of the night, Jesus comes walking across the water. To, when, the next day, when the people find him, John six twenty five, they found him on the other side of the lake, and they asked, Rabbi, when did you get here? How did you get here? Very truly, I tell you, Jesus says, you're looking for me not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. What have you been trying to fill yourself up on? Another working title for this message almost became, what are you going to give up for Lent? Empty calories. But that one hit a little too close to home for me. Anyway, he said, you followed me because you ate the loaves and had your fill. And then Jesus says this, and it's reminiscent of that Isaiah 55. He says, don't work for food that spoils, 
but instead for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on Him God the Father has placed His seal of approval. Don't work for that which spoils, but work for that which endures to eternal life. Come to me, all you who are thirsty. Come, you who have no money, come and buy and eat and eat of the richest affair. That which endures to eternal life. The people, they... They heard what Jesus was saying, but they didn't have a frame of reference for it. And they said, well, so what kind of work are you talking about? Work for food. Don't work for food that spoils, but instead for food that... What kind of work, they asked Jesus. What must we do to do the works God requires? This is a hidden gem in John's gospel. It is a hidden gem. It's in, it's in John chapter 6, verse 28. What must we do to do the works God requires? And Jesus answers, and I love this. It says, the work of God is this. You're asking about the works. Jesus says the one thing that God requires of you is this, to believe in the one he has sent. You who have no money, come by and eat. Why, why spend money on what is not bread? Why, why spend your labor on what will not satisfy? No, he says the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. Precious one's going to tell you, if you've been trying if you've been trying to work your way into heaven, that's just not the gospel. If you've been trying to earn your way somehow through your good works and, and your stalwart behavior, if you've been trying that, if that's been your play, for why should God let you into heaven, precious ones? That's just not the gospel. The everlasting covenant that God wants to make with you, with me, the everlasting covenant of love is a covenant of love that gives when you've got nothing to give in return, that, that offers when you have nothing with which to pay. The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. There's this place in Matthew's gospel where he talks about, when you remember this one, where he talks about no one takes new wine and pours it into old wineskins. Maybe you've heard why. The why is, is that new wine, as it, as it ages, it expands and it'll just, it'll, it'll explode, an old wineskin. And praise God, we get to be new creations in Christ Jesus. And when the new wine of the Spirit of God flows into our hearts and our lives and it begins to expand, it expands our hearts, it expands our lives. There's a story I came across years ago when I was a seminary student. I'm not going to read it to you, but I, but, but I printed it off. It's, it's written by a man named Thomas Traeger. And it's about the, the wedding feast at Cana. He says, I'd like to think that there was some wine left over. Jesus supplied enough. John says there were six stone water jars, 20 to 30 gallons each. That's somewhere between 160 and 180 gallons of wine. <laughs> oh, Jesus is so extravagant, especially since they'd already polished off the initial supply. Surely one 20 gallon jar would have been enough, but no, Jesus, wildly extravagant. I'd like to think that if there was some wine left over, maybe after the couple goes off on their honeymoon and the guests all go home, maybe some thoughtful family member would have thought to bottle up the leftover wine and put a cork in it. And maybe, maybe the couple coming back from their honeymoon is presented with crates <laughs> of this wine that had once been water and was touched by the master's hand. I picture the couple delighted, smiling to think that on their meager budget that they can enjoy such heavenly vintage with their low-cost supper. In the way of eager young couples, they don't plan very well at first. And so at the end of a couple of years, they realize that as extravagant as Jesus was, there will come a day when it'll run out. And so they begin to save the wine for special occasions, bringing it out on anniversaries and birthdays and 
dedication of a child, that kind of thing. High holy days that feature feasting and drinking. And every time they taste the wine, they relive their wedding day. And they recall how at the first sip of Jesus' wine, they had looked at each other with eyes that shone with a love whose intensity caught them by surprise. And so the years pass until they're an old couple keenly aware that all flesh is grass springing up in youth and quickly fading. I picture the old couple on a chilly night. She's in front of the fire trying to warm her feet and hands. They're always cold now. And he pauses coming into the room where she sits on a bench pulled right up to the grate and he studies her in the light of the fire, the shape of her forehead, the creases in her face, the lips he's kissed 10,000 times. And with a prompting he can't explain, he blurts out, Honey, honey, what if we finish the wine tonight? The rabbi's wine. There's just one little bottle left, and it might warm you up a bit. Sure, sure, she says. That'd be great. So he goes and gets the wine and brings it back to the fire with the only clean cup he can find. And he sets it down, uncorks the wine, speculating, I wonder if it'll still be good after all these years. Always has been, she says. The rabbi's wine has never gone bad. It's as amazing as the way he provided it. The husband pours the first serving and he hands his wife the cup. She sips it and hands it back to him. And they look at each other and they nod in agreement. The wine is as rich now as the day they were married. They drink it very slowly. And as they drink it, they start to remember. She says, I remember when Sarah was born. You'd have thought that nobody had ever been a father before the way you carried on, calling in the whole neighborhood, and they drank an entire crate of this wine as if it was our wedding day all over again. Well, you did the same thing when, when Rebecca and Benjamin brought home our first grandchild. The wife laughs a hearty laugh. Yes, I did, didn't I? Oh, those were such good times. Good enough that you'd want them to carry on forever and not stop. He pours some more wine and they each take a sip and she stirs the fire, staring at the flames. And then she sees him out of the corner of her eye. And she notices that he's trying to hold back tears. She knows what he's thinking. He's remembering when their third child died. They tried everything. He had been so sick. But he died anyway. And all she could pray for weeks on end was, My God, my God, why have you forsaken us? They were both so distraught. And God didn't seem to answer their prayers. They didn't know what to do but blame each other. (laughs) One evening, he came home, and she had supper ready, and they set the things out on the table, not saying a word, going through the motions. That had become become their ritual of habit. The only thing that held them together day by day now. And when they sat down, they realized she had forgotten to get water from the well and he had forgotten to bring any wine home from the market. So he got up and he found one of the bottles of wine from their wedding. Might as well open it now. No sense saving it for special occasions. Special occasions don't come anymore. And so he opened it and he poured some wine for each of them. And when the wine touched their lips, they tasted grace in their hearts. And they broke down and they sobbed together. And the grief of their loss never went away. How could it but the strength to carry on through their grief together was what that wine, the wine that Jesus had given them, that's what carried them now. And now sitting in front of the fire, he turns to look at her. Hearing him move, she turns toward him and they look at each other. And she takes his hand and says, I know, I know. He's silent and holds the bottle upside down over the cup, just a few drops left, and he hands the chalice to her. Here, you finish it. She takes the smallest sip and hands it back, pointing that there's still just the tiniest bit in the bottom of the cup, and he puts it to his lips and throws back his head, holding it straight over him, and slowly brings it down and holds it between them. That's it, he says, with a voice that sounds both satisfied and sad. It's all gone. None to pass on to our children or the grandchildren. Now just the story of our wedding at Cana 
and the rabbi who blessed us with the wine. Just the story, but no wine. The wise woman says not to worry. They'll just have to get their own. Where have you been turning? Where have you been turning for joy? Here's that old, that old country song, looking for love in all the wrong places. Where have you been turning for escape? Escape from the sameness or, or the dreariness or whatever it might be that you need to escape from. Where have you been turning for joy or for escape or even for coping? Where have you been turning? Because precious ones, there's an invitation you have from God. How have you been spending and laboring, trying your best, trying your hardest to hold it all together? How have you been spending and, and, and laboring and finding no satisfaction, no peace, no relief? And so here's where it comes down. Will you let God make this everlasting covenant with you? A covenant with you that says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. A covenant that says, I've known you from the moment you were formed in your mother's womb. I know everything there is to know about you. And I love you. The new covenant. A covenant that even when I turn away, God holds on to me. Precious ones, as we prepare for Easter, what do you need to let go of in order to take hold of that love of God? Can I pray that over you? Father, in Jesus' name, they would remind our hearts of how good you are. In Jesus' name, Lord, would you remind us how, how it's not about how good we can be, but how good you have always been. Lord, in Jesus' name, that you would point out the things in our lives, in my life, Lord, that I've turned to instead of turning to you. And Lord, Lord, would you invite me home? Come, come, all you who are thirsty, come and drink. Come and, and, and you who have no money, come and buy and eat. The choicest of wine. <laughs> God loves you, precious ones. And I love you. And I can't wait to worship together with you. Love you. See you soon.